Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And today I am joined by my good friend and occasional nemesis, Dr. Philip Chase. How are you doing today, Dr. Chase, Dr. Fantasy, my nemesis? <laughs> well, I'm glad you said it in that order, good friend and then nemesis. Because Frenemy, Frenemy, there we go. Yeah, that's the term, I guess, right? Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm doing very well. Thank you, Dr. Canavan, Professor Fireballs. We, I'm doing very well indeed. And I'm, I'm feeling actually in a very good mood because we solved a mystery between the recording of the non-spoiler version of this discussion and this video. We solved a mystery, didn't we? Yes, the happy birthday, Dr. Philip Chase mystery. So <laughs> to recap, if you haven't seen Philip's video, Philip opened a present that he assumed was from me. And it was. And No, no, hang on a sec. And I looked at it and went, what? That isn't what I sent you. Put it on, put it, put the tiara on. Okay. And, and, and the sash. I gotta put the sash on? Fine. Well, you but hold I'm... it up. Ugh. It's a sash, right? Yeah, think about cotillion. So, <laughs> Philip, ah! Philip had received this gift and, and assumed it was from me. And I'm going, that's not what I ordered you. It turns out, ladies and gentlemen and, and gentle viewers, it is from me because what I ordered him, they've delivered the wrong package. <laughs> See, and I just thought you were being snarky. That's what I thought this was. You're being snarky, Professor fireballs the critic <laughs> so yeah no there is a gift it just isn't a tiara uh, no but now i now i wish that that was the gift that i'd sent you because that's brilliant <laughs> well i can't wait to see the looks on the faces of the people when i return this um <laughs> yes you woke up going hello yes i'd ordered some books and actually i was sent this tiara and then this sash <laughs> I think maybe you sent me the wrong package. So, so I shall do my best to look dignified. So that that all being said, that the, the whole purpose of this video, Philip, is we were meant to be doing a spoiler talk. Yes. About Orb Scepter Throne, <laughs> the the fourth of the novels of the Malazan Empire, which we are reading so out of sequence in the yes. conversation that they have with the Malazan Book of the Fallen, which we, we need to talk about. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah, we're out of sequence. It's mostly my fault, but uh, yeah, I mean, we've read the Malazan Book of the Fallen before, so we know the story. So for us, it's not a problem so much, but we don't necessarily recommend that you <laughs> read the, the books in the order that we're doing. So, no, yeah. yeah. Um, so, to be clear, the events of this book happen after the events of Toll the Hounds. Right. Now, I read Toll the Hounds before it was published. Yeah. Which is the only time I've read Toll the Hounds. So you can imagine when I was reading this going, I am trying to remember back to when Toll the Hounds was published as to what exactly happened. Who was that character again? But I will say, even though my memory is terrible and I, I didn't remember all the events of Toll the Hounds, this book still works. It oh, still yeah. works as a story, even without that contextual information from Toll the Hounds. And yeah, if you've read Toll the Hounds, more of it will work. You will get more out of it because you will know who the character, who some of the characters are and why they are there. But right. the book itself actually works, even though uh, you may not have read Toll the Hunts. So I just, I wanted to get that out of the way because um, I know people tend to think you, you have to read the Malazan Book of the Fallen and then you read Ian C. Esselmont's books. This one actually, I think, works perfectly um, yeah. in between Toll the Hounds and uh, Dust of Dreams. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it is a, it's a lovely novel to, to go between them because there are developments in this book that actually impact Dust of Dreams and The Crippled God, which we will not be discussing. No, no. Because that would be spoiling those things. It also would, uh, part of what we're gonna discuss here 
is going to have spoilers for Toll the Hounds. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah. there's no way around that. If you haven't read Toll the Hounds and you, you want to approach it uh, with entirely fresh, thank you very much for watching thus far. I hope you've enjoyed the story of the mystery gift that Dr. <laughs> Fantasy received. The strange <laughs> looks that your postman must have given you when yeah. it's addressed to Dr. Philip Fantasy. <laughs> 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 don't give it don't, don't give paul any more ammunition than he needs okay so I, and it's a tiara and a sash <laughs> oh god speaking of paul everybody you should be reading his well not i mean if you want to have a fun time making fun of uh professor fireballs and dr fantasy you should read paul's uh I, short in fact, stories. I i will link i will link yeah. to paul's stories in in this description yeah um so let, let's talk about Orb Scepter Throne because again, like I, this is a reread for me, but it is a fresh read for you. So I'm I'm really interested in what your impressions are, and you know, hopefully then I won't talk over you all the time like I normally do. Oh. <laughs> and and we can have a conversation about the things that you find interesting. Yeah. Oh gosh. I mean, there's a lot in here. I loved what. Esselmont does with the the fragments of Moonspawn, and we have the uh, the fate of Moonspawn in the Malazan Book of the Fallen is in Memories of Ice. It crashes into the water, and this is where it turns up it, off the coast of southern Ganabakis. And these fragments, which they very creatively name <laughs> the spawns, uh, these islands basically formed out of this mountainous city whatever you want to call it um it's just such a great i mean esselman is so good at atmosphere and i love the atmosphere that he establishes within these fragments and they're it's like they're deep in the bowels of of the earth almost and the layers of civilization that they uncover of, of now of course you know very well if you're a Malazan reader that Moonspawn was originally not a Tyst and D construction, right? It's a Kachin Chamal construction, but it seems that the Tyst and D have lived in it long enough to make it their own. And there are all these, you know, the, the decor is very Tyst and D, uh, <laughs> right? Um, and, but it, it's it's weird. Some of it is very Gothic, and yeah. then. And then some of it is, uh, I, and by Gothic, I, I I mean Gothic in the sort of the literary sense, the, the sense of the sublime, that yeah. yes, some of it is very strange and very alien, but also achingly beautiful. Yes. Um, the description of going through the, uh, the cave where the entire roof had been on the walls carved to yeah. appear like a forest and these jewels uh, inset into all of this sculpture that are glowing in this sort of magical light. So they're walking through a glittering twilight stone forest. And yeah. it's it's both alien and strange and beautiful and arresting. And yeah. that evocation of how strange and startling the, the teeth actually are, they are not human, They they are radically different the the fact that when they're walking through moonspawn and it is in absolute darkness yeah and you know that's a major plot point until they you know figure out a way around it and we suddenly right. get this sort of mage sight of what it is like to perceive night as yeah. a tea standee what a perspective and the introduction of the character orchid i i believe this is the first time she comes up in anywhere in any of the books I love that. I love that you have this character who belongs to the more, I guess, uh, the world of the present and, and in some senses growing up unaware that she has Tice Andy heritage, that she has their blood in her veins and that it, it's and so interesting. Alien, yeah. And Alient blood. She's both Tice yes. and Draconic. So she's yeah. descended from that line. And do you know what blew yeah. my mind the, the first time I read this? All yeah. the way through, um, she's referred to as the girl, and they think of her as this young woman, this young girl. Yeah. And it, turn, it turns out, 
she goes oh yeah they they brought in these tutors to teach me and then they left you know it's when they dying. got old yeah yeah and you go okay she's actually incredibly she's had generations of teachers yeah. who were yeah. humans who came in to teach her and then to her no time is really passing and you suddenly have a sense of how the the taste perceive the world that it is to them humans grow up in age and die so quickly that a semester at college for her is a human lifetime yeah. yeah and that that is actually seeing it just told in that way makes it far more real i think and and uh, almost easier to encapsulate than when we hear about say the uh, the the blower view of humans as children yeah, yeah which yeah. you kind of have to try and wrap your head around suddenly with orchid we are seeing it and you go oh that actually that that makes sense yeah yeah she is a character that brings together a lot of things and that sense of vastness that sense of history like you're saying the uh the perspective that we suddenly get with her as that is revealed that that conversation where she's talking about her tutors wow i i i share your awe of that moment uh, for sure and she's in company with ansi who was a he was a bridge burner that i didn't necessarily like that much uh, before because nobody else liked him <laughs> the characters i mean he's always fretting and uh he seemed kind of annoying but I really love what Esselmont does with him in, in here. And of course, there's this heartache because he is one of the survivors. He is one of the few bridge burners to make it. And you really sense the, the PTSD in him and the restlessness, it's the survivor's guilt. So his journey, I mean, yeah, there's all these people who are fortune hunting there in the spawns, but what really brought him there was he needed to see the resting place of of his comrades of his brothers and sisters uh and it's it's just a beautiful thing that Esselmont does with this character ansi who suddenly became one of my favorite bridge burners now because of this story so i really appreciate that and it's interesting that you mention his ptsd uh because it's very clear that rest uh, restlessness that that view that survivor everything that is that is in him it's very clear that's what he's suffering from but it's never spelled out that way it's not didactic you're not being told oh this is what's happened to him we right. see it unfold as he's there as you know he's making he's rationalizing to himself oh yeah i'm here to get my nest egg and you're like no you're not no. that his whole his plan didn't make any sense what he was doing didn't make any sense the number of times when he has an opportunity to pick up the jewels and these priceless things and he doesn't yeah. because that's not why he's there and he can't admit it to himself yeah and yeah. then when he sees the shades of the bridge burners and they they do the lassie go home sort of thing of you know go away lassie we don't love you anymore you're horrible you're terrible go away <laughs> and he's oh, yeah. oh, and, they, and we I, I, and i think this is one of those times when i think the author uh takes pity on the reader because we could have read that because of who ansi was that maybe yeah. they did actually think that and he makes sure to include a scene of, do you think he bought it? Yeah, with Mallet and yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's just so beautiful. And you're so right that Esselmont is too good of a writer to spell it out. You know, he, he lets us figure it out. And it's just beautifully done. I, I love that arc. And of course you have Corey and Lim, who is a, he's a great, uh, you know, another reminiscent of the Three Musketeers. He's got the gallantry and, and all of that. And I enjoyed his character as well and the mysterious thief malachi uh so malachi is an, an interesting one because uh and we, we can come we'll come back to that in a second but, but carry on with what you were saying oh no really i mean i do find him interesting because i'm never quite sure if if uh he's as bad as ansi seems to assume he is uh yes he's he's rather mercenary um is he malicious 
I'm not so sure about that. He's a character I feel very ambiguously about, and I'm not. He, uh, you know what? What made made me feel like he? I feel more ambiguously about him because of his motive for being there. He wants to see the gardens, right? Uh, and which is so, it, in a way, it's such a poetic, beautiful thing for him to be there. His 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 reason for being there isn't to get rich. I mean, perhaps he already is, and 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 wealth is not really a problem. But his reasons for being there are are, are egotistical, yes, but they're they're kind of poetic too, aren't they? And you see, this is why I think he's a really interesting character, because if we think back to Night of Knives, when Kiska viewed Temper, how did she see Temper? This monstrous, scary, frightening. Um, and yet when we were in, in from Temper's perspective, we know that's not what he's like, because we get his uh, his internal character. What we see with with Malachi is very much external. And it's from Ansi's perspective, and he treats every he views everyone with this level of distrust because they are not bridge burners. They're right. not his comrades. They're not soldiers. They're not anyone he trusts. He doesn't trust anyone anymore. And so a lot of how I think Malachi is being portrayed is casting him in a monstrous light, which I think actually affects almost the physical perception that Ansi has of him. And the reason I suggest this, and I don't know, this is something I would like to talk to um, Esselmont about, because yeah. I, when I was reading it, I was convinced that Malachi is actually Cutter. Oh. Because oh. we have all of the knives. We have him being... Um, oh, the Gardens uh, of the Moon being so obsessed with getting here, huh. being very well trained with the knives. And we've seen how Crocus becomes Cutter, becomes very good with these knives. We've seen how fast he is. Yeah, and he yeah, does this good. trick where he makes the knives appear and disappear, which was exactly the trick that he used, that we saw him practicing in, um, uh, before Drift of Alley in... Uh, 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 is it... Uh, House, House of Chains? Chains? House of Chains, yeah. House of Chains. Yeah. It, it's the same trick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so, you, it makes sense. And, and obviously, and I reason, didn't think of it because my jaw was down here, but yeah. And the reason I think it's Cutter um, is, oh, oh, well, he gives the name Malachi. He had no reason to do that. You go, well, Ansi had no reason to give the name Red. They're yeah. in the middle of something where you're not going to tell people your real name. And what is Malachi's reason? He wants to go to the Gardens of the Moon to yeah. get a flower for Absalar. Now, we can read this very, very literally as he wants to go to these fabled gardens of the moon to get a flower as a votive offering for Absalar, the goddess of thieves. And he is ah. some sort of thief. Or ah. we can see it as this is Cutter literally going to get the flower from the gardens of the moon that Sari talked about yeah. in Gardens of the Moon. Yeah, gone to get this to prove his love for her as part of that story arc. Of course, of course. Yeah. No, no it, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. But the thing is, it's not definitive one way or the other. But yeah. I think in combining how he is being seen, there are enough of the ticks there of the tricks that he does with the, the daggers and the yeah. fact that, yeah, he is kind of cold and he's he views Ansi as a he's evaluated Ansi as a threat, but he's like, yeah, I'll just do this. This is the the more confident cutter that we saw yeah. growing in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. But oh, it's yeah. because he's going to the Gardens of the Moon to get the flower for Absalar. I'm like, yeah, that's that's cutter, but I don't know. Oh, it's brilliant. I I, I mean, if, if it's not true, I will just assume it is anyway. <laughs> So, and because we do meet some of his companions from, from previous books as well. Barthol is there and Skilara um, in, in this book, in Orb Scepter Throne, they are residents of Durujistan. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I think your theory really, it holds water. I love it. Because all 
of the Phoenix Inn crew are represented. Yeah, Malik is Malik Rail, and yeah, except Marilio, of course. But he's in a way, Marilio is replaced by Corian. I feel like, but you know, similar personality, maybe. But that it's so it's the return to Darugistan, the return to seeing what the crew is now up to. So it seemed yeah. natural that that character is actually Cutter. But I. Again, I, I don't know. It's a theory. We can we can always ask Esselman. Well, it's a brilliant theory anyway. So uh, that's that's great. Um, you mentioned Kiska as well, and there's that thread in here um, at the uh, what is it called? The the, uh, the shores, shores of, of creation. creation. Yeah, the shores of creation, and of course Tayshren, your favorite. Uh, Got to talk about Tayshren now. Come on, you can't tell me that he's come full circle here, hasn't he? He's he's uh, well, back to me hitting him again. No, well, okay, not full circle. He's done a 180, not a 360. Uh, so he is absolutely, a, you know, one of the, the major heroes of this world when you consider what does he do? Of course, at the end, uh, we have to talk about that, but he, he makes an incredible sacrifice. He gives up this place of uh, where he feels p at peace and he comes back to the, the world in order to do something that actually in a way is, is a very, it's a very sacrificial act. Uh, I don't know that he's very sure he's gonna come out of this. And it has to do with Kroll and the, the Kroll's weakening or poisoning or whatever his, he, in a way is, has Taishan just saved magic for everyone by his act at the end of this. I wanted to ask you about that. Um, well, I'm trying to think of how much of this has actually developed in, in later books and how much is ah. you know, we, we know from this point. And I think, to be perfectly honest, I think from this point, it is established that Taishrin uh, was the premier mage of of the era. Yeah. Um, like, uh, Quick Ben is powerful. You have these powerful mages. But Taishrin is in some way far more attuned to what magic actually is. And like Dancer, like Kalanved, he is in a position to ascend. And in Return of the Crimson Guard, we saw that sacrifice of throwing himself into the chaos rent right. Right. to protect the world. And this is one of those things that it, it was witnessed by all of these people. And remember, this is one of these aspects, like ascendancy is both nebulous and complicated. And right. we know that the worship of a figure in addition to personal power but the worship of a figure can can achieve something and okay. he is worshipped by kiska uh -huh. and that worship is a point of connection yeah but he goes into chaos and what is chaos chaos is untrammeled destruction and creation so we see him on the shores of creation where where chaos and creation are meeting where life is being created worlds are being created but also being destroyed and he's dragging these these demons out of the water and trying to save them. Right. Um, and I think what we see here is very similar to those myths of having uh, your mortality burnt away. Um, that yes. in that moment of being thrown into the rent, he died. Uh, his hum uh, human life was burnt away and he was left this essence of a character, this magic and it is shaped then by his time and like all of these things if you remember the the fall of gandalf in the lord of the rings in the uh, mines of moria i right. wandered for a time broken and he hasn't fully recovered all of his memories and then right. when he meets up with um aragorn and legolas and gimli again and they go gandalf the grave oh yes that was it things yeah. start coming back i'm like this is this is something we've seen before in fantasy yeah. and Kiska cannot get that reaction from him, but the sacrifice of the, um, what was that doll thing that called? Six figure thing. Uh, you mean, what was his name? Because it was the, the queen of dreams, little guide thing that had led right. him to that. Um, right. I don't but, know if it, does it, did it get a name? Um, oh, I always forget these things. My yeah. memory's terrible, Philip, yeah. but, Regardless, we have this moment where basically his past uh, catches up with him 
And you have that, this peaceful monk-like, I don't like magic, I like the order of creation and chaos, where magic is an imposition on that realm that is tearing rents in things, that is causing destruction. That's what magic does. And here he is on the shores of creation, order and uh, gentle creation. The, the antithesis of that, and that's why he says, I can be that character or I can be my past, which is everything that I currently hate. And Kiska suggests the third way of reconcile them. Yeah. And in that moment, that's when he sort of truly ascends to godhood. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, Krull, uh, who is female this time, uh, which we can talk about in a second. But sure. Krull, we have seen, has been weak in time and time again. That Krull was already weak because of Kalor's curse. And now, with the assault that the crippled god has had on the Warrens, he is even less powerful. He's even more sickly. It is, I suppose, would be they are, if you want to use that term, right? Uh, less viable. So someone needs to take over. Someone needs to become the new sort of god of magic. Right. But what did we just see? There's the personality then, the personality from the past, and when you put them together, a choice gets made. Mm. So if Tashran, even an, an Ascendant, joins with Krull, is Tashran going to be wiped out? Huh. Is Krull going to be wiped out? Or will there be a third way of a reconciliation of these two entities? Yeah. And that's where we see Tashran become Teren. Right. Tren. Yeah. He says, call me Tren. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. I, I was reminded a little bit of uh, the end of a wizard of Ursi with Ged and his unification at the end of that. I don't want to spoil that book for anyone, but that's a beautiful book. Um, a similar moment of uh, beauty, I would say, um, and, and wholeness, a, a realization of wholeness. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, so I loved Tatron's arc in here. I thought it got really interesting. And of course, Leoman is there as well. I mean, we, we should mention him and his, uh, he, he does something similar to Tatron. Tatron was there for a while in a bit of denial. Yeah, he had amnesia from being in the, the Vitor uh, and all of that. But um, I feel like he also somewhere in his mind knew perhaps, and didn't want to know. It's like, no, I don't want, if you're from my past life, don't talk to me. Uh, this is a place where you can, you can just be at peace. And Leoman is seeking something similar, isn't he? Uh, because of his, I mean, Igatan is one of the most horrific war crimes in, in the entire uh, Malazan world. Uh, so is, is Leoman seeking peace as well there? Um, and, you know, Leoman has always come across as this, uh, as this pragmatist yeah and i pretended to be yeah i'm not affected by it but let's face it he, he is affected he is haunted by it yeah. a lot of a lot of what he does is a projection is a is a front and his story is of course mirrored in exactly what we've just been talking about with tashran the past in conflict with the present and it's a way of trying to reconcile those two things to form who you are and this is the, the, what I think is the sort of the grander theme about this or the uh, extension of this into a more sort of metaphorical or symbolic level would be we all have aspects of our past, whether or not we profess to never have any regrets. I, I think most of us have things that we look in our past and we we have made mistakes. We, we do have regrets. And yeah. it's not about, oh, if only I could go back in time and change it. You cannot do that. But what you have to do is accept that part of yourself and from that moment it's not about forgiving yourself it's not about absolving yourself it's about recognizing that it that is part of you now move on be a better person learn from that accept that that is you and learn from it learn from that experience and if i had to sort of extend that out into a sort of more metaphorical thing that's what i think is going on with leoman what I think is is part of what's going on and we see in, in Tashrin. And that connects to the grand themes of the, the Moranth and the, the Segula. Yeah, 
That's a great segue. So let's go there. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we did talk about them in a more broad general sense in the non-spoiler discussion, but here you have two peoples with a very serious legacy. And the, the Segula, for example, they have this past that I think this even the second isn't entirely where because the, the 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 former first the one who died and was never replaced didn't tell him everything because it would have been too much of a burden to know and we're just piecing this together here this is a great book if you want to know who these segula are and how they got to be what they are and they were initially protectors of a sort uh, of Darugistan who and and this, this is one of those really interesting linguistic things. So we know that terrain, that a little apostrophe signals in the sort of chunk's been taken out, so it's now a change, a change of state, uh, right. maybe pass. But the Torad Cabal, we yeah. find out that was the world, the word for shield in the, huh. the ancient language. And seg, uh, Segula is a derivative of the word for anvil. Ah, sword and anvil. Huh. So, uh, shield, anvil. The the shield anvil. The torrid shield. Sorry, that's what. Sorry, torrid was shield, and the segula were anvil. So between the two of them, you had the shield anvil of, which is a term obviously we know we have learned from the other religions. Yes. And we can In now the see the the yeah. the origin of this. So they were the anvil. They were um, the protector, part of the protection for the tyrants. Yeah. And they were slaves. Why, why did they have masks? The tyrant wore a mask and they were his slaves. So they right. were denied their own personality. They, yes. Why were they numbered? Because they were numbered according to their usefulness. Their rank determined how useful they were. Yeah. That everything was organized by a hierarchy that you had your best ones and they were the the high uh, the lowest numbers and then you had the rest of the agati it was like yes and you will now go out and do that and everything was about protecting the tyrant being his his anvil to beat uh things with so and in then that case, they, their, their exile is was actually an escape and that's that's when when john sees that at the end when he re when he realizes that halfway through the book of no we we weren't sent into exile. We got away. Right. And how things have been twisted over time. We think of all of those stories of uh, cultures who, in our past, we twist the narrative to make us look better. And we gloss over those things that are shameful. We gloss over those things that uh, make us look bad. Oh, yeah. We, and then over time, now that they've been glossed over, they, they, shave away and, and get lost and they get forgotten and the 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 other bit that's left makes us look good and then that gets elevated and polished until it forms a complete narrative that that's now oh that's exactly what happened because this happened over thousands of years yeah yeah incredible uh and and their interactions with the other group we're going to talk about the morans uh some of the most powerful aspects of this book for me. Of course, there's the convergence at the end when they're in Darugistan and, and there's this threat and there are many heroes in, in that, like Tessera, for example, Torvald's wife, who has the, the presence to have the gas turned off and to make a bunch of pots um, and to put out the fires. I mean, she's a great character, um, but the Moranth, uh, just, uh, I, I'm skipping around here a bit, but I have to get this out. The, the Moranth, the part in the story where there is the battle. Initially, it's the Malazans who are, turns out these mighty Malazans are basically being used as pawns in a sense. Um, and they are <laughs> their fodder, to their lure essentially, which is what the ambassador kind of figures out there. I, but before we get that, let, let's take a step back and we'll talk about when they get set up and the, the Malazans are on the fort, they're in the okay. fort and we have yeah. the fist going right I'm going to hold, uh, we'll, we'll act as a deterrent. You guys get away and we'll slow them down. Yeah, yeah, that's important. Yeah, and that's the uh, the female fist. Uh, what's her name? Stepin, right? Uh, yeah, and fist Stepin acts as this. She's going to, to delay the Segula. 
And right. Segula have basically dispensed with anyone near them. Right. Uh, like that's that's how good they are. And yeah. they come up to the fort and they go, just leave. We we don't care. We'll, we'll just right. go round. Yep. And it's at that point you suddenly realize the Segula do not care about the Malazans. Yeah. That 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 is is unimportant to them. And you go, but hang on a sec, the Malazans are very, very important. How could the Segula not care? And yeah. it's well, who are the Segula actually interested in? The Maranth. And they're using the Malazans as bait to draw the Maranth out into conflict. Right. Because that's their ancient enemy. Yeah. Yeah. And the and poor that Malazans, leads up to, to this scene that I think that we want to talk yeah, about. Scene which is so powerful because, and this is what we were talking about in terms of the horrors of war theme and all of that. You have these, this very admirable uh, yet rigid people, the Segula, who are just have, have shown us that they cannot be defeated by anyone in combat. And then they assault the Malazans and the, the Morath are waiting for their moment. And when it comes, boy, does it come. I mean, this is just explosive. And they're throwing from their, um, their what are they called? The bug things? The coral. Uh, coral, thank you. <laughs> from their corals, they're dropping cussers on the Sagula. And it is horrible. It is so horrible that the Malazans were just being cut to mincemeat by the Segula are horrified by it. And they are weeping as they're forced to finish off the wounded Segula, who are so rigid that they, they just keep coming. And it is such a, a gut-wrenching scene because you have these characters that we've been following, the, 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 the new guy who was in the gang in the in, butcher. Outside of, and butcher the butcher uh who i think has has seen real butchery now um and he uh he he's an interesting character because he forms this bond with his squad with the sergeant the one who's always smiling and who gets blinded uh and and then killed later but um wow i mean that scene just had me absolutely i mean that is one of the most really powerful battle scenes in the Malazan world for the message because you have these soldiers who are they don't want to do it and they're and they're they're forced to do it it's, it's really something and that, and that's i think one of the things that we've seen small groups of segula we've seen in duels we've seen how dangerous they are and then we yeah. see this army of the segula turn up and the rivi who have turned their back on kaladin brood and gone oh yes we'll do and it, and the Segula turn up as the arm of the tyrant saying, well, you're going to bend the knee. And the Rivi are like, no, but we're, no, we're going to be a free people. That's the whole point. And they're like, right. no, you'll be, our, you'll be under the dominion of that. And they're like, no, no, that's not going to happen. And of course, they have thousands of the, the Rivi there. And right. the Segula just slaughter them. And then they come up against the Malazans. And the Malazans have a fort that they've built this fort. And it's like, it doesn't matter. They're, no. they're just move past it almost as if it's not there, that this is how dangerous they are. We see the Malazan shield wall, the thing that has been uh, part of their tactics that's helped them defeat all these other armies. And the Segula are just whipping their swords past because it's just a delicate, quick slice across to take off someone's eyes and nose, which is what yeah. happens to um, the, the Sergeant uh -huh. Hector. Exactly. Uh, that dips in to take out the tendons in the shoulder or to slice off part of someone's head as they're ducking away. That, that They are such consummate blade masters. Yeah. That they are the perfection of this martial form. And right. even though there's so few of them and they're up against an army, this is this great clash in fantasy of the perfect warrior versus the almost perfect soldier because that's what we right. see in the Malazans. They are a military the Segula are warriors. Yeah. And we see this clash. And ultimately, I think, at, in the end, it takes so long to train a Segula that the Malazans would ultimately win. But it, they'd go through a lot of troops. But we see the Malazans retreat. They, they set up their last stand 
and right. they have been cut to ribbons. They have been eviscerated yeah. by this foe who is just beating them in battle. Right. And then they witness the carpet bombing because that's what this is. This is the carpet bombing yeah. of these warriors. Yeah. And in that moment, that it's what it immediately reminds me of is the charge of the Light Brigade by, uh, by Tennyson. Tennyson. That here is this old way of thinking about warfare, this old way of thinking of the warrior, the stylized heroic warrior, the, the consummate martial artist. And this right. is not how wars are fought anymore. Right. And in that moment, you can imagine the relief initially of the Malazans going, I'm not going to die. Mm -hmm. But how quickly that relief turns into the horror yeah. of watching this. Because right. I don't care if you think the Malazans don't hit the Segula. They don't think the Segula are mon The Malazans right. have faced off against all lots of different races, lots of different cultures. The Malazans are made up quite often of the cultures that they've conquered. They're so right. used to facing off, yeah, well, that's the enemy, and they fight them, but they don't hit them. They don't loathe them. They, 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 it's not that, oh, look, the Segula, they're monsters and terrible, and we have to... They don't feel that way about them. It's just an enemy to fight in battle. And they watch these people be absolutely blown apart. Right. And uh, that, to me, it, the... Do you remember the scene in Apocalypse Now of the napalm coming down, the airstrike coming down, and the massive napalm strike setting fire to the, uh, to the jungle? Yeah. But that's that level of devastation. If you imagine if you were standing there watching that and you saw people in that fire, mm. I don't care if you go, well, I don't like them, or I'm relieved they're not going to attack me now. You're still watching people die in such a horrific way that in in some respects you can admire the Segula. They they raised this martial form to an art. It, it is deadly, it is horrific, it is it is horrible, but it is also beautiful. It is a perfection of the art. And right. um even in Fight Club, this idea of, you know, I wanted to destroy something beautiful. This yeah, is yeah. the destruction of something beautiful. But it's, but it's also, in addition to the horror of all of this, it's the passing of an era. This is uh, World War I, where you had these romantic notions somehow that had survived uh, about warfare, and you had literally soldiers kicking soccer balls out into the field ahead of them because this was a game, right? And then suddenly they were mowed down by primitive machine guns, Gatling guns and such. I mean, it was just... And of course, you had tanks invented in this war and aerial warfare and and gas and all kinds of horrors. And it was pretty tough to be so romantic about it um, after that. And so you get the sense that in addition to just the horror of what they're witnessing, there's this sense of this, this looming um, new era that we have suddenly entered. And it is not pretty. Um, and then we find out that this this antagonism goes all the way back to the tyrants because the the Moranth used to be settled all the way through the continent and the tyrant destroyed them. And although it, it talks about the age of the tyrants, plural, we yeah. find out it has been one tyrant the entire time coming back again and again and yeah. not. Ca oh, it went wrong that time. Well, I'll try a wee bit differently this time but keeps going back to the same thing over and over again. The past, yeah. this doctrine of the past and the tyrant never learns. Yeah, yeah. And again, we, it's this idea of different aspects of the past coming to fruition in the present and affecting it in different ways and, and the different ways that we react to it. The Maranth learned from what went wrong. Right. They retreated to the, the mountain fastness and they evolved. They trained and right. raised the quarrel so that now they had aerial attacks because the Segula couldn't reach them. Right. They developed more and more sophisticated ways of producing these alchemical solutions because 
the Moranth have uh, the Segula have no defense against that, right? Because right. no one can face off against the Segula in hand to hand combat. Right. But the Segula are a backward looking culture, and the Moranth are, are a innovative, forward looking culture, and that we see the difference on the battlefield um, at that moment. Uh, so, and yet they're although, still isolationist. Yes, they are both isolationists in, 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 their, in these ways, but uh, the, the, and we do see a, a different kind of standoff ha that happens in Darujistan later, uh, of course, but that is also with the intervention of this protective dome that is there. Um, and so that makes a difference in that conflict. And, and yes, when they're on the ground facing off against each other, it's the Segula who uh, have the advantage for sure. But, um, but one, one last thing on that is yeah. Why we talk about the Segula being like so rigid and, and locked into this, so are the Maranth. Yes. When, when faced with, you know, we could just let the, the remainder of the Segula go. Well, no, they're going to have to give up their, their weapons. Well, no, just let them go. Like, enough is enough. Call it a day. No, they're going to have to give up their weapons. That it yeah. was going to carry on because the Maranth were so locked into that mindset. It's... I mean, talk about rigid. They literally live in chitinous armor. <laughs> And a caste society. Yeah, and a caste society. Yeah, um, absolutely. So they are just as regimented in some respects as the Segula. Um, yeah. And it's the, the Malazans and the Daru who show them a different way of doing things. Yeah. And even then, we find out that the, the Torrid Cabal, Baruch and Mamut and, and all these characters that we thought we knew, no, they were demons. Yeah. And they've... In some respects, you almost get a sense that after they were freed from the tyrant's last rise, that they have been almost keeping Darugistan in a certain state because yeah. that's what they are comfortable with. They are so long lived and they go, we're working behind the scenes. And yes, you can have your political machinations as long as it doesn't upset the apple cart too much. Mm. That this cabal has been around for th hundreds of years, thousands of years. Thousands, yeah. Steering Darugistan, but steering it basically to keep it almost in place. And right. it hasn't, it, yes, it's one of the most important prosperous cities, but it hasn't grown and expanded the way that the Malazan Empire did that had drive. Um, they've kept it in, in stasis. Yeah. Well, if, if we can shift gears a little bit, I, I, there are some lighter aspects to this. And one of the ones that I enjoyed really was the relationship that developed between the Segula Saul and Yusuk, their, their, um, their guide, at first <laughs> involuntary. <laughs> but I, I loved the, the interactions. And that's kind of what one of, one of the moments I was talking about with the high context, low context, because obviously Saul comes from a very high context culture where you have to pay attention to the signs and the body language. And, you know, and, and Yusuk here just, everything comes out, whatever is in here comes out and in the most colorful way. And it's a really fun thing to watch her figure out these Segula. And of course they're, they're terrifying as well, but she goes from completely naive about them thinking, all right, well, just let's kill these guys, you know, and then having a bit of a revelation there when they wipe out that one uh, uh, settlement and uh, she goes from there to being compelled to be their guide, but then developing this, I think, interesting and possibly, in her mind at least, romantic relationship with Saul. Um, so, well, I, I and love we know at the end, uh, Lo approves. Yeah, yeah, and Lo approves. Yeah, and it, Lo, Lo is thinking that it's Saul's initiative, but really it was Yusuk who sort of brought this about. So there's two points about that particular storyline that I really like. One is her gradual assimilation of the knowledge of how to read them. Yeah, yeah going from that ignorance, then through fear, um, to then resignation. And then she yeah. goes, well, I might as well learn from it. And it, she starts then to read their body language. And she can't understand, later on, she can't understand why no one else is getting, you, you can't say that to him because yeah. she can read them all now. And yeah. it reminds me very much of uh, the, the film, The 13th Warrior, where Antonio Banderas's character as yeah. the diplomat learns uh, Old Norse just yeah. by listening. And slowly you get those 
English words dropped in as because it's from his perspective and it's that's the, the conceit. And yeah. and he learns the language until they're telling it and he just interrupts them one time and is right. speaking perfectly. And they're shocked. Yeah. And that's what we've seen play out here with uh, with Yusek, that she has slowly picked up over time all of these different things. And we see that she's she's built this up. And the other thing that I liked about this storyline, obviously, and them going to meet Dasa Moltor. We had to talk about Dasim, yeah. Yeah. Um is this is it reminds me a lot of those old kung fu movies or uh, the the martial yeah. arts movies where it's yeah. the 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 wise the the brilliant swordsman who's retired to the monastery because he's given up the sword he's given up battle and uh, you know he's there sweeping sweeping the courtyard and it's the perfect sweep of the brush because it's all about yeah and we see this all the time in the in these movies and they yeah. turn up and he refuses the fight yeah. but so much of that is that um, the, the Kung Fu movie of let's go and meet the master and him disguising himself as the least among them and all of those sorts of things. But again, yeah. when we see Yusuk there, she picks up on beforehand, completely ignorant of their abilities, then fearful of their abilities. And then it's, no, I want to learn that this actually is quite useful. And she's when we have those conflicts, the, the testing, um, and we see him fail, she's right. watching it and learning from it. She's recording it and then yeah. asks him to teach her. And it, it's the same process. And I love that it's so consistent with her characterization, so natural in terms of a progression. Yeah. And it made it all feel more vibrant than, say, a pastiche of uh, an old Kung Fu movie would have. Yeah. And, and it's lovely how she brings out Saul as well um, with her vibrant personality. But of course, as you said, Dasim Ultra becomes uh, part of this thread in the book as he is essentially, uh, in a sense, forced to join them. Uh, he doesn't want to. But I love how at the end, we do see some flexibility introduced among the Sagula because Dasim goes from seventh to first without fighting anyone. And he dons the mask and he is an outsider who is brought into the Sagula culture. So that shows to me incredible flexibility and the second, what he does to, to bring this about knowingly, that's a, that's a pretty cool moment too, when he allows, he forces the third Gaul to kill him yeah. in order to bring about this resolution. Um, it's just like these, these Sagula, when it comes to combat, they're playing chess like eight moves ahead of everybody else. Um, so very but cool it, stuff. I love the, the Dasim thread in here. Um, and it is, it gets to, I don't know if you've ever watched like the, the Olympic fencing um, or like very, very high level martial arts that you, yeah. you're seeing these people and in, in terms of skill, they are the same. It gets to a certain point where you just go like skill is, there, there's nothing between them. And it right. comes down to something ineffable, be it strength of mind or strength of spirit or focus or, you know, it, it's those sorts of things. And that's what we we suddenly realize with the first, the second, the third, the the seventh, the tenth. They are all basically the same. Um, the, there's very little between them. And what we see with Yan is as second, his world breaks. Yeah. Everything he knows about his world breaks, and he sees that that God will the third will carry them on down that path because it is the tradition. You fall they, back on tradition. Yeah. yeah. They need someone who has a different view, exactly. but who will be accepted into the tradition. And Dasim is obviously perfect for that because he is both at once one of them and not one of them. He yeah. beat Rick. He, he is the seventh. So he right. is one of them. He's proven he has that level of skill. Does he have... The insight and you go well he refused the fight he he can see yeah. a different way and then yan realizing that he's going to have to sacrifice himself because he cannot do it he is part of the tradition 
and yeah. he has to break the the cycle which means letting himself be killed because of the psychological damage that will do to the third yeah it's he's and, sorrowful more sorrowful about that the damage he's going to do psychologically to his friend the third than he is about his own death of, of, of course he regrets he'll never be able to get together with the sixth um but uh yeah it, it's really a beautiful powerful moment um so i mean again and it's a, a different way of looking at what warfare means what conflict means what contest means that we've yeah. seen in this um and it, it's fascinating because their duels at that level are not meant to result in death they are not meant to result in right. injury it's That's the right. almost the antithesis of what we saw on the battlefield the battlefield was what the tyrant intended for them that's how the tyrant used them right and what they'd evolved into was no we 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 do this so we don't hurt people with it because it's about yeah. the showing the skill yeah not killing people killing he people regretted, is he even regretted early in the book when he has who the third who had taken over as third from gaul challenged him this young gun who wanted to be a more aggressive and and uh jan knew he was gonna have to do something that would incapacitate this young fellow and he regretted it that he would even have to do it and he cut his tendons in his elbow um, and and knew that that was going to set him back but, and he would never be as good again ever right, right. doesn't so matter he, how well you recover from that yeah yeah, yeah. but I, I think one of the telling moments is when jan is sent to execute the prisoner yes and he's like no no that's not what we do and right uh the tyrant the legate is no you do what i tell you to do you are my sword this is yeah. this is how i designed you you kill for me right. and that is not the concept that they have now evolved of themselves so yes right. they are regimented yes they are stuck in this this sort of uh, mode of one version of the past but they evolved away from what the tyrant intended for them and that that's causing this this breakdown in their perception of reality yeah, um, yeah. so i thought i i think that is it, it one of the really interesting things because again it's about the regret of killing these immensely skilled martial artists and yeah. yes the skill was developed to kill but dasim rejects it the, the the best of the segula reject it that's not what they want yeah yeah you get a sense that uh dasim is another one of those characters who's trying to hide from his past like tatrin like leoman uh, so that seems to be a running thing in here as well and he m many times well ha says even i never made a good decision yet um so I mean, i'm not sure i'm the person you need here very reluctantly put allows himself to be put in this position he's almost he's very deftly manipulated into it actually isn't he um so yeah but again so you, you rightly pointed out that we have tashrin this accepting the past moving on looking to the future leoman accepting the past uh, as part of himself and looking to the future, his relationship with Kiska. Kiska look to the past and this future maybe with the claw, with Topper, uh, plus with Leoman by her side. Yeah, uh, yeah. And we have the same with Dasim. Dasim crippled by what he did to Rick, but now accepting this new role and looking to the future. The Segula mm -hmm. looking, finding out what the past truly was taking a hard look at themselves and looking to the future. The Maranth being shown that there is a different way to do this. Yeah, or how about but, Orchid? Orchid accepting her various parts of, of her past and who she is and, and entering a new era based on that acceptance, uh, I think, yeah. And the expensive yeah. lesson learned by the Rivi of rejecting yeah. Caledon Brood Mm. ending up so many of them dying right. and no we we have to look to the future like this this is such a prominent theme explored through all of these different characters these different cultures 
yeah. on the micro and macro scale that we have seen time and time again in each of these books that this is what Esselmont does. He gives us these themes that recur on the, the small scale and on the large scale. So I, yeah. absolutely brilliant book. And we haven't even talked about his representation of crop. Oh my goodness, yeah. The, the fellow behind the scenes who's doing a lot of the, the uh, important stuff that uh, of course, they wouldn't have gotten rid of the tyrant, would they? The, the legate uh, without Krupp's little interventions and, and using, he's, he's not only good at manipulating people, he, he's good at putting people in the right place at the right time and using poor left and scorch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but they're in a way inadvertently kind of heroes there, aren't they? Uh, because they fill the legate with uh, the special uh, bolts, the uh, crossbow bolts that uh, do the trick. And these are especially made uh, at Krupp's uh, instigation uh, by Barathol, correct? Yeah, yeah. From, the, from the shards of, of Dragnapur. And yes. what, one of the things I love, Krupp is in some ways barely in this story, and yet he is everywhere in this story. The eel. And, all of those moments where it's there's the little pastry there's the the bit of cloth there's there was yeah. a disturbance in the dust over there there was a oh that thing happened and it's crop being everywhere and we, we've seen crop is actually far more powerful far sneakier and yeah. everyone always underestimates him and yet he is there behind the scenes manipulating everything and being aware of all of these things and being a force for good Yes. Because yeah. Just imagine if Krupp was evil. Yeah. Yeah. We, we would be seeing more than, than pastry crumbs at the scene. That's for sure. And we get a sense that Krupp has been a, a force in Darugistan for quite some time. Has he been there uh, for thousands of years? I don't know. But I think Esselmont hints that Krupp has always been there to try and uh, oppose the tyrants. Krupp yeah. is part of this always taking the tyrant down. Yeah, he's something that's not even understood by the Tord Cabal. He's he's something outside of them even. So yeah, that would suggest something pretty ancient, I suppose. And I love the fact that uh, Vorkin, as part of the Cabal, protects yeah. herself from the tyrant by locking herself in otaderal manacles and yeah. basically sealing herself off so that the tyrant can't control her mind. And then um, oh, I've forgotten the, the old witch and Krupp Derrida. is Derrida. Yeah. yeah. And Krupp is basically bringing her the drugs so she can keep herself so stoned yeah. that the tyrant can't control her mind because it's, it's not there. The, yeah. These members of the cabal doing things to protect themselves from the tyrant. Yeah. And poor Baruch. He gets caught. Yeah. And yet this is how we find out that all of them are demons. They're yeah. not humans. Well, Taya also, I mean, there's the poetic justice of her ending up in the Otateral chains that she uh, mocked her mother when she was in. And uh, so there's a, uh, where her mother has put her to learn her lesson, I suppose. Um, but uh, clearly she's more than human as well. Um, and I, that must come from, from mommy, I suppose, but the yeah, interesting mother-daughter relationship there. And I love that one of the things in this that I thought was really interesting is when Topper sees her and they have their fight and then he foregoes taking his revenge to leave it up to Vorkin. Yeah. He, he lets go of it. He lets go of, uh, to, Quote, sorry, let go of your hit. Um, and he's not controlled by it. And yeah. this, this again, is, is something we see on the side of the Malazans. That is the lesson that is being learned by all of these other people is let go of this ancient em uh, enmity. Um, yeah. That enmity. Yeah. Yeah. Enmity. Uh, yeah. That yeah. stop taking these personal vendettas. Vendettas lead to more vendettas. Yeah. Um, and we see, even with humble measure, oh, yeah. uh, you know, he'd orchestrated the rise of the legate because then they were going to raise an, and get an army and he was going to create these things and that would protect the Rujistan. And yeah. it all goes terribly wrong. And he goes, I've learned my lesson. I, 
the the feeling, the wanting to protect Darugistan was the right feeling, but right. how I went about it was the wrong way to go about it. And now he's an agent of the ill. Yeah, yeah, such good stuff. Uh, wow. Well, I feel like we've covered. Uh, is there anything else we need to bring in here? We we I've covered almost. Well, I'm sure we'll you know as soon as we stop once again we'll be like oh we forgot this and this and this. But, there, there is loads more that we could talk about, but oh, yeah. it, it, these these things were like, you know, like my poor throat. And also, it, uh, I have to say, it is getting a bit dark and, and lit here. So, yeah. Philip, um, thank you so much for this. Like, did you enjoy like reading through this? Because this was your first time reading it. Yeah. Oh, I can't tell you how immensely I am enjoying this series and every single book. Uh, it has been just astounding to me. And I'm so glad I'm reading the novels of the Malazan Empire for their own sake, because these are wonderful stories. And I, I hope we've conveyed just how moving they are and, and how entertaining they are and how deep they are, because I, I really just am, am enjoying the series tremendously. And I have to say too, as, as you've remarked many times, even though they are their own stories, they have increased my appreciation of the other series in the Malazan world by both authors. So I feel like there's so many wonderful connections to make and they're not just Easter eggs, they're connections that add meaning and depth to each of the books. So this is something else that I am just appreciating and, and I did not know to expect all this. So it's been a, a fantastic journey and, and of course, I always say this, but you're such a big part of it, AP, for me. And, um, you know, and even though you gave me a tiara for my birthday, I'm still I'm still loving these collaborations. Well, thank you so much, Philip. And, I mean, it's a real pleasure talking to you because I suppose like, we, you just mentioned there basically the, the sympathetic resonance between the two series that they build, they they build on each other. And I think part of our conversations, the what I one of the things I really enjoy about them is like you say something, I'm like, oh yeah, that's a great point. And we'll talk about that. Uh, and yeah. then, you know, I might mention something, I go, oh yeah, there's nothing. And then you go off and and you build on it in a way that I wasn't expecting. And we, we have fantastic conversations about this that lead me to have a deeper appreciation of what I am reading and learning to see books from someone else's perspective and to see what they pick up on and how they interpret it is almost like getting to read the book anew because you're seeing it with completely different eyes. So thank, thank you so much for being part of these conversations yeah. and adding to my understanding and appreciation of all of this. And uh, happy birthday again. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you very much for watching. And we'll, we'll see you in the next one.